Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning. Shavuot over everybody. Uh, today's class has been sponsored anonymously for the Refuah of all of Am Yisrael. Hashem uh, should bless our anonymous sponsor uh, with all the blessings of the Torah. Amen. If anybody would like to sponsor our class, please email us info at ejsny.org. Rabotai, I would like to share with you as we begin a new perasha this week, uh, and that is perashat emor, perashat emor. And our perasha deals with many things, but one of the central sections of our perasha is chapter 23, and uh, I actually urge everybody to read this chapter, because this chapter deals with all of the holidays. In one chapter, it goes through all of the holidays in our Torah. It begins, of course, with the first festival, Pesach. It goes to Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. It goes through the holidays of the year. Of course, you won't find Chanukah, you won't find Purim, because those stories happened after the Torah, way after, right? But the main story, the main, the, the, the Oraita commandments, the festivals, are all listed in this week's parasha, chapter 23. And there is um, one interesting uh, holiday, and that is going to be chapter 23. And that Pasuk says in Pasuk 9, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them that when you enter the land of Israel, you shall bring an Omer to the Kohen. Ah, Omer. We all know that word. We are now in the middle of counting Sefirat HaOmer. Right? And actually, it began... The count, the, when, is it, when does the counting begin? It begins on the second day of Pesach. And we start counting every day. One, two, three. Right? Today is 28. And we're counting all the way till Shavuot, till we get the Torah. We count 49. And then the next night, we are ready to receive the Torah. And the Korban HaOmer, um, the, the, the counting of the Omer was initiated by a Korban. Today we don't have that because we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. But when we did, we had the temple, we would begin counting only after we brought a Korban. And take a guess. Take a guess, everybody. What was that Korban called that we brought on the second day of Pesach? That Korban that initiated the counting. That was called the Korban HaOmer. Ah, very good. So the Korban HaOmer, and then we count from that day Sefirat HaOmer. And actually, the Korban HaOmer, we may sometimes belittle it because there's nothing important about it, nothing significant about it. But look what the rabbi said. The rabbi said, Let the mitzvah of the Omer not be light in your eyes. For it was through the mitzvah of Omer that Abraham merited to inherit the land of Israel. So there's something very unique about Korban HaOmer, which we brought, um, and, that, and God says, This is why we merit the land of Israel. And we are today going to ask a very simple question. Why? What's so important with the Korban HaOmer? What is the Korban HaOmer, by the way? The Korban HaOmer was on the second day of Pesach. They brought a Korban of barley. And this barley is what allowed all the upcoming produce of the year. Remember, we're not farmers today. We have food available 24-7, 365. Every day of the year, you could get every type of food. But it wasn't always like that. It used to be. It was a process when you farm. You have to you have to plant in right. You have to plant in the beginning of the fall, and then you right. You plow. You sow. You water it throughout the winter, and then we harvest. We harvest it now in the um, uh, in the holiday of Pe of Pesach, right? And none of that produce, none of the grain was allowed until we brought. A korban on the second day of Pesach called the Korban HaOmer. Now, the name Omer, what does it mean? Anyone know what Omer means? And again, we're using the word every day today. Hayom Shemona Ve'esrim Yom La Omer. What's Omer? What is it? What is it? You say it's Rabbi, it's a Korban. It's a korban. Okay, very good. But let's go back to the korban. What was? What does it mean? Korban haomer. So actually, it's going to be shocking. But omer doesn't mean anything. Omer 
is actually a measurement. It's like saying um, grams. Omer is like saying, uh, um, it doesn't mean barley, no. It does not mean barley. It's a measurement. And actually the measurement was the, it was equal to a tenth of an ifa. Again, we're not going to go into measurements. But it, it was a measurement. It's like saying a volume, an amount of barley. It's an amount. So Omer is an amount. It's interesting. Because usually a korban is named after the goal of that korban or the purpose of that korban. Think of a korban that you know. Right? What's a korban that you're, you, that you're thinking of? Or maybe thinking of korban khatat. Okay, so what is a korban khatat? To, to atone for a chet, a sin. So hence the name khatat. A korban shelamim. That's shalom for the sake of peace. Korban toda. That's to say toda. Thank you. Toda. Toda lecha. Right? Toda. And all of a sudden, when we get to this korban, we don't name it after the goal. We name it seemingly after how much flour, how much barley, of uh, barley flour can, is contained in it, right? And it's and how much flour an omer's amount. And and to just strengthen the question again, we when we count the omer every day, hi yo today is such and such amount of omer. I mean, it's a very weird way of counting. Basically, what you're saying is, tonight is such and such amount of days in the count, which begins on the day when we bring a korban that consists of a form of omer of flour. It's so... And again, omer, most people don't, don't even know what it means. They think, what do you mean? Omer is this time that we're in. No. Omer is a measurement. Again, all of this needs to be explained. We need to understand why are we naming the counting after a measurement, grams or uh, liters, right? Imagine I'm going to bring a korban of a liter. That's the name of the korban. That's such an odd name. And really, the word omer itself is not so correct because omer is just a nickname for the real amount. The real way of saying it is isaron an efa, a tenth of an efa. That's the correct measurement. I'll give you an example. You know, in, uh, in America, we use Fahrenheit. Whenever someone from Europe or, or you know, maybe Asia, they come along, they say, um, oh, it's so hot today. It's 20 degrees. Like, what? <laughs> That's pretty cold. It's not, it's not 20 degrees today. They say, yeah, look, it's 20. And they show me their phone, and then I realize they're talking about Celsius. So in their, in their phone, it's 20 degrees. It's because it's, it's they're talking in a different measurement. Efa is not the normal way that we speak in the Torah. We never use, uh, excuse me, Omer is not the normal way of saying it. Omer is like using Celsius when you're in America. We don't use Celsius in America, we use Fahrenheit. We shouldn't use Omer, we should use the more common verbiage of Efa or a tenth of an Efa. All of a sudden the Torah is insisting that we use the name Omer which is not normally understood. We, we don't actually ever have that other, uh, that, that amount in the Torah. Matter of fact, the word Omer appears only one other place in the entire Torah. Chapter 16 of Shemot describes at length the falling of the manna. Actually, there is a segula to read every day this uh, paragraph, um, and it's a segula for Parnasa. Okay, someone that's struggling for Parnasa, of course, um, after we've checked all the boxes of our mitzvot. But this is a segula to uh, try to help a person with Parnasa. We read about the man that fell from the heavens every single day, right? And do you know how much man fell? Anyone know how much man fell every day? It wasn't uh, just random. It wasn't like rain that a lot fell and you took, you took whatever, you know? There was a specific amount of man fell every single day. Take a guess. An omer per person. Again, an omer is an amount. Let's just say it's 100 grams. 100 grams of omer fell every day per person, okay? We're using this tissue box a lot lately. 
But this, this is how much man fell from the heavens per person in the house. If you had five people, five boxes fell every single day on your front lawn and, and you'd pick it up. One Omer per person. That's very interesting. And by the way, when you, when, if you notice and you read those verses in chapter 16, when the man fell, it says that Moshe took a flask of man and he put it away in the Holy of Holies and he kept it forever. If today you find where that Aron is, where the Ark is, we don't know where it is, but if you find it, you open it up, you find a little man. You find a little uh, flask of man. Amazing. And there's a few other things in there. And um, the Jewish people ate the man for the 40 years that they were in the desert. And when it comes to the last verse, the concluding verse of this chapter, which is supposed to be boom, right? Amazing. Finish it off line. And by the way, the Omer was a tenth of an ifa. That's the, that's the climactic ending of the verses with the man. How anticlimactic, right? Well, that's seriously how you're ending it. Those are the parting words regarding the Omer, the man. That, by the way, I want you to know that the, that the man and the Omer is equivalent to a tenth of an ifa. Who cares? That's not the way to end the paragraph. You know, imagine a rabbi gets up there, he gives this amazing speech, fire, and then he ends off, uh, you know, on some regular average line. Right? You're waiting for that ending. You're waiting for that one line, boom, mic drop. And then uh, they, they end it off with something regular, not, nothing, fa nothing fancy. Right? So, um, the, 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 all these questions, all these questions. We notice right away that the Omer that we bring on the second day of Pesach, the Omer that we count now in the days of Shavuot, they're only mentioned one other time. And that's with the man. And there seems to be a link over here between the Omer, the barley that we bring on the second day of Pesach, and the man, the Omer of the man. And the question is, how are they connected? And so today I would like to share with you an amazing, amazing chidush from the Be'er Yosef. Okay? Rav Yosef Tzvi Salant, who we quote often in these classes, says the Be'er Yosef. Try to think about how it was like to live in the wilderness. Try to think of what it was like to live in the Midbar with the Jewish people and Moshe before you crossed the Jordan into Israel. Okay? Try to think about it. Close your eyes. Right? You're living with the greatest leaders in history. You have every day man coming to your front door. You have every day water. You have every day clouds protecting you. You're studying Torah. There's no real estate headache. There's no stocks. There's no business. There's no retail, wholesale. There's nobody that order, or owes you money. There's nobody that uh, is returning. There's no Amazon. There's nothing. No UPS. What a life. What a peaceful life, right? You, you, you all day drinking from Hashem, eating from Hashem, learning Hashem's Torah. You with Moshe Rabbeinu, Miriam Neviah, Aaron Kohen, the greatest of the great. You're seeing miracles all day long. And all of a sudden, now you got to go into Israel. And when you go into Israel, the man's going to stop. The water's going to stop. The learning from Moshe is going to stop. How are we going to eat, Moshe? Oh, when you go into Israel, very simple. You're going to plant. What do you mean, what do you mean plant? Like plant? Yeah, you're going to have to start, you know, planting, you know, growing, uh, you know, harvesting and cooking, baking, etc. You're going to have to make your own food. But that takes a lot of time, Moshe. Yeah. And, I mean, it, it, I just, <laughs> it's just nice over here, like, you know, we, we having bread from you and water and we, all that we need to take care of. I don't know if I want to go back in, into Israel. I mean, I, I think this is actually maybe nicer. I'm getting supported by Hashem all day long. Right? Actually, the spies, we're going to read about them in the summer. The spies, when they go into Israel and they come back with a negative report, you know why? According to some commentaries, this was their motivation. 
They say if we go into Israel, we're going to have to start plowing. We're going to have to start producing and working. And we don't have time for that. We don't have time. When are we going to learn Torah? When are we going to spend time with our family? All the headaches of business. We would rather stay our whole lives in the desert. And that's why they spoke negatively about the land, hoping to stay in the desert so they could have a closer existence with Hashem. Now this sounds very nice. This sounds very admirable. But at the end of the day, we know that what the spies said was a sin. We know at the end of the day, the Hashem didn't want us to stay outside of Israel. He wanted us to come into the land. And this transition, going from spiritual in the desert to a physical existence in Israel, clearly is ideal and is preferred. Um, but, right, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge. It's definitely a challenge because, yes, the goal is not to stay in the desert. If you're going to live in a utopia, that's what an angel is. We don't need that. We want you to go into the world. We want you to be active and involved and take the physical world and elevate it and make it holy, make it spiritual. And we should, by the way, we have to realize this. When we go to work, we're not doing something that's second best. We're doing a mitzvah. We're doing a mitzvah. We're going out, we're getting involved, and we're taking all of the physical world that we're in, and we do it honestly, we do it with integrity, we do it with emunah and faith, and a smile and, and simcha. We are doing mitzvot. Working is part of our mitzvah, what we're here to do. And we shouldn't feel ashamed of it, we shouldn't feel uh, that it's that it's embarrassing, it's not ideal. That's what the Jews said when they were going into Israel. It's not ideal. Let's stay out here in the, in the desert and let's learn all day long and not get involved with the world. Hashem, that's not what I want. That's not what Hashem wanted. Hashem wants the tzaddik to not be separate from this world, but to be part of it. That was the mistake of Nadav and Avihu that we read last week. They died and they died because they got so close to God that they kind of took themselves out of this world. God says, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. I want, I want people that are going to take the world and elevate it. When we take a cup of coffee and we say, Shehakol, we just elevated all the beans, all the milk, the cow, everything that's in it. We elevate it with the beracha. When we, we take an animal and we eat the meat and we say it and we use it for Shabbat, we're elevating. We are elevating and we can elevate. When you take bricks and you put a home together and then we raise our children in it to keep them away and separated from the horrible influences of the world, to invite guests into our homes, to do haqnasat orhim. We just elevated all the bricks, all the cement, all the furniture, wherever we shop, right? That's a beautiful way of elevating this world. However, however, the challenge is, the danger, the danger is that once we get involved with the world, sometimes we get carried away and we get caught up and we start forgetting that uh, the goal of the physical is to use it for a mitzvah. We end up making the physical the goal itself. And ideas are beautiful, but sometimes in the course of time, when we're living in the physical world for so long, we, we get too absorbed, we get very involved. And so Hashem knew this was a danger. Hashem knew that as we go out, we're going to maybe forget about Him and the values of the Torah and the values of the mitzvot. And so God decided to give us a, a little bit of a help before. What measures did God do to ensure that we don't forget what the purpose of the physical world is? The physical world is not a goal in itself. It's not an uh, end of itself. And, and God says, I need to make sure that they remember this. And so what does he do? Before we eat, and listen to what he says. Before we eat any of the produce, before we eat any food every single year when we harvest, Pesach and on, <clears throat> the first thing that we do before we eat is we bring a korban haomer. That korban, by the way, that korban is what allowed us to eat all the new produce of the year. Until we brought that offering, 
We weren't allowed to eat any of the grains. You know what it's like? <laughs> you, know, you ever went to pray in shul on Shabbat or in your home, and all of a sudden, after the prayers, everyone goes to the, to the hall where they have kiddush, everyone grabs a little grape juice, and you're starving, and you're thirsty, and all you want is, is to be able to eat or drink something. And you're waiting for the chazan or the rabbi, whoever it is, to say the kiddush. And the rabbi comes, and you're saying kiddush, and you're just like waiting, and all of a sudden the rabbi starts, you know, going a little bit longer. The chazan starts taking his sweet time. You're like, oh my God, just shut up already. Finish the kiddush, I'm starving, man, let's go. Right? We're so hungry, just hurry it up already. You can't eat until the guy says kiddush. We are not allowed to eat food of the new year until we bring Korban HaOmer. That's very interesting. The Korban HaOmer, this barley offering that we brought in the beginning of the year. And this is, this, this you know, what's, what's in this Korban? Think about it from a farmer's perspective. He invested six months, maybe more, right? Or all the way back from the beginning of the summer, they're preparing the land, they're plowing the land, they're taking care throughout the winter, and finally they have food. They have some barley. They have ready to go, ready to eat. Let's make some pizza. And what do we tell the farmer? No one's allowed to eat until we bring a korban haomer. And we remind the people, yes, that's what yashan is, by the way. That's what yashan is. And we remind the people, all of our efforts are beautiful, but the one guiding them, the one blessing them, is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the purpose of the Korban, says the Be'er Yosef, the purpose of the Korban is to remind everybody why we have all this blessing, who gave us all this produce. And what was it called, by the way? What was the Korban called? It was called a Korban HaOmer. Mm, Omer. You know what's Omer supposed to trigger when you hear that word Omer? Omer is supposed to remind the Jews, wait, Omer, time out. We had that word one time. Where do we use that word, Omer? Oh my gosh! That's the same amount of man. When you hear Omer, you're supposed to think man. When you hear Omer, you're supposed to say, Oh my gosh, you know who gave me all this blessing? You know who gave me everything in my life? The same person that gave us the man. Who gave us the man? Did we work for the man? Was that our efforts? The man was purely Hashem. We woke up every morning. We came out. We, we picked out some man. We ate. We were satiated. Who took care of us every day in the desert? Who gave us that man? Hashem. The same God that gave us the Omer of man. We start in the beginning of the produce season. Right after Pesach. Second day of Pesach. We start bringing Korban HaOmer. We start reminding ourselves that it's Hashem who's giving us this food in Israel as well. It's not me. Hashem needs to bless our efforts. And, and that's something that's easily forgettable. When we work hard and we make money, we forget that it's Hashem. We start thinking it's us. We start getting a little bit arrogant. We start thinking that it's our finesse and our tactics and our savvy and it's all me and I'm amazing and this and that and the other. We have to remember, it's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessing our efforts. And by the way, with this we understand something very interesting. Do you know when the Omer, the, when the man, the Omer of man from the heaven that came down every single day, when did it end? Anyone know when was the last amount of Omer finished to, eat, to be eaten? It lasted for 40 years. But what date? What was the day of the year? The last day that we ate man. And this is remarkable. Pasuk says actually in Yehoshua that the man finished the day after Pesach. We get into Israel with Yehoshua ben Nun. Remember, we, went, we entered Israel um, 30 days after Moshe died. We cried for Moshe and we went to Israel in the beginning of Nisan. And that's when the man ended, the second day of Pesach. And so what comes out is that <laughs> the events that transition from the Omer of man in the desert, right away they finish on the first day of Pesach 
And we go right away into the second day of Pesach, and we bring the other type of Omer, the Korban HaOmer, which reminds everybody that Hashem is the source of the food that we're about to start planting and eating and growing, just like He was the source of food of all of the man that we had in the desert. And so this is something that's um, such a powerful message for the people that are entering the land of Israel. As they're ready to stop all the miracles and they're about to get involved and they're about to work and they may mistakenly think that this is us. And Hashem is giving them a reminder, something to keep them grounded, something to remind them that it's not you. And when we say, when we bring the Korban HaOmer, and by the way, the Korban is nice, but what do we do today in 2021? But we don't have a Korban. What are we to do? And so Hashem instituted for us, we don't have the Korban HaOmer, but instead we have Sefirat HaOmer. And the Sefirah as well is supposed to remind us every day when we say, Asher Kedeshanu Bemitzvotav Vetzevanu Al Sefirat HaOmer. We're supposed to think as we say those words on the counting of the Omer. We're supposed to stop for a minute and internalize. Obviously not to stop because we're saying a Beracha. We have to go straight into the counting. But before we say the Beracha, after we say the, the, the Mitzvah, we're supposed to think, you know what, this Omer? What is Omer? What is it? It's a measurement. What does that have to do with anything? Ah, it's a measurement that we had in the desert of man. Oh, just like God gave us man. God's giving us everything else in the world. By the way, with this we explain something very interesting. Anyone know how we count the Omer? The way we count the Omer, we count the days, and then we and then we like give like a total arithmetic summary. You ever saw this? The guys know what I'm talking about, the ones that count. Right? We say today is 28 days, which is, by the way, just in case you weren't sure, how much is 28? It's four weeks. Today is nine days, which, by the way, is one week and two days. Right? Seven plus two is nine. Very good. Hazaku Baruch. Why all of a sudden, when it comes to counting, are we educating the Jewish people on math? First of all, we're all accountants, so we were very good in math anyways. <laughs> but why in the world is the Torah teaching us math over here, arithmetic? Today, and, and make sure you know that it's 28. Right? What is that? It's the most interesting thing. right? We don't have that in any other holiday. That we're recognizing the day and we're recognizing the weeks. Why is that relevant? No one, no one, no one ever said, <laughs> um, today is nine days. Nine? How much is nine, Rabbi? Nine? Oh, nine is, is a week and two days. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I didn't know that. <laughs> who, who, who doesn't know what nine is? Opposite. You're saying a week and two. It's making it more complicated. Says the Be'er Yosef, because there were two miracles in the desert. When it came to the man that came every day, there were two miracles. There was a daily miracle and there was a weekly miracle. There was a daily miracle, man came down per person. And there was a weekly miracle every Friday when two portions of man would come down because you need it for Friday, but you need it for Shabbat. Because you can't, you can't carry on Shabbat. They weren't allowed to bring in the, the man from the fields into the homes on Shabbat. By the way, on Shabbat, no man came. Man came for only six days a week. And they, they, would, they would bring double on Friday. And that's why, by the way, we have two breads every Friday night and Saturday morning on Shabbat. Why do we do two breads? Why two? Because we had two portions of man. To remember the double man, we have double bread. And, 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 and that's why we count in the Omer, the weeks and the days. To remember the daily mitzvah, but to remember also the, week, the, the daily miracle of the man, and to remember the weekly miracle of the man. Every day man came down, and every week on Friday, two mans came down. And this was a miracle within a miracle. And so we kind of want to remind ourselves of these two miracles, and therefore, and therefore we count the Omer daily, but also we make sure to mention Shehem, which is also one week and two days. 
a week. Yes, there was two miracles every time the man came down. This is uh, a very powerful way of, uh, again, reminding and instilling in the Jewish people the emunah that we need, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one and the source of our Parnasa. And by the way, the, this explains one last interesting idea. The Korban that was brought with the, on the Omer, the second day of Pesach, when we brought the Korban Omer, and we brought the, 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 the sheep, Along with the sheep, we bring also a separate, cor- a separate amount of flour. We bring the sheep, and we bring also a mincha, flour. Usually, every korban gets one-tenth of flour. When it came to the korban, the sheep of the Omer, we brought two-tenths. Two-tenths everywhere is one-tenth. Here, two-tenths of flour. You know why, says the Be'er Yosef? Because again, we want to remember the two types of the miracles that existed with the man. The one-tenth because the weekly miracle and one-tenth for the daily miracle. This is amazing, amazing chidushim from the Be'er Yosef. And just to conclude with one last thought. One last thought. To remember, first of all, let's put it all together. Um, And by the way, we now appreciate why, why Hashem said, that we only enter the land of Israel because of the Korban HaOmer, because of the Mitzvah of Omer. Because like we said, it's very, easy to get, it's very easy to get distracted and to forget when we enter the land of Israel, really, why do we deserve this? Who's giving all of this to us? Maybe we're going to lose focus. Maybe we're going to lose sight of the bigger picture. And Hashem said, you know what? I'll give you Israel. you get it. But you need to make sure you do the Omer. The Omer will keep you grounded. The Omer will keep us in check. And it's so interesting, by the way, that besides for giving us a successful way to live in Israel, the Omer is the link between Pesach and Shavuot. Right? We know that. It's what initiates the counting from the second day of Pesach. And it's all the way till the day before Shavuot. So you have Pesach, you have Shavuot, and we have 49 days that we count in between. A person's ability, a person's ability to receive Torah, a person's ability to be able to say, you know what, this year I want to live a life of Torah. I want to be more dedicated to Torah. I want to be more dedicated to mitzvot. Is going to be affected by their perspective of who is ultimately in control of our livelihood, of our panasa. So long that we feel that you know our success is ours and that I'm in control of my own destiny and I could, you know, my efforts is all I need and that's what's going to guarantee my parnasa. That person will have very little reason to want to be involved with Torah. Why should I study? What book? What God? What Torah? No Torah, nothing, it's me. But the way we work towards Matan Torah, the way we are able to receive the Torah, when we realize that we are so dependent on Hashem, that we need HaKadosh Baruch Hu every single day. And our rabbis say, the Torah could only be studied by those who ate the man. You know, that's what it says in the, in the Gemara. The Torah was only given to those who ate man. That means the Torah could only be entrusted to the people who devoted their time and their energy every single day to appreciate that their parnasa, their physical sustenance, was provided by Hashem. And so we count the Omer each year. We reabsorb the message of the man. We reabsorb the message of the of the Korban HaOmer. We remind ourselves that yes, we must do Yishtadlut. Yes, we must try. Yes, we have to put in our efforts in every single possible way. Throughout the day in business, we do our best, of course, 100%. 100%. But when we're done, at the beginning of the year, before we touch that food, don't eat till you say Kiddush. Don't touch the grains. So you bring Korban HaOmer. It has nothing to do with us. Omer. Ah, Omer. The man. The man was also an Omer. The man, it's a trigger word. It should remind us of the man. Every day when we count the Omer for the remaining days of the Omer. Next year, every single time we count, we need to, it's a, it's a message, it's a lesson in Emunah. It's a lesson in Emunah every time we say the word. Who gave us food? Who provided for us in the desert? Hashem, Hashem could provide for us here. It's easy, same, same difficulty for Him. The 
providing for us in the desert, for providing for us wherever we go. And just because we are more involved, it doesn't mean that we now need to keep Hashem more out of it, God forbid. These are amazing, amazing, powerful lessons of the Korban Omer. We should be zokhir to always make sure that when we are, when we are blessed, in our efforts in Parnassah to remember the source of that blessing. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful day.